the vacuity of the politics of jouissance. The short circuit between Stavrakakis's ontology and politics is not difficult to guess. The acceptance of the constitutive whole in the symbolic, the lack in the other, provides the space for theorizing democracy as the institutionalization of contingency. This brings us to the political wager of Stavrakakis's book. To combine an ethical attitude that reinvigorates modern democracy with a real passion for transformation, capable of stimulating the body politic without reoccupying the obsolete utopianism of the traditional left. Such a combination has to enact a delicate balancing act, avoiding both extremes of passionless egalitarian democracy a la Habermas and of passionate totalitarian engagement. The balance is between lack and excess. Lack is articulated in discourse theory, while excess points towards enjoyment as a political factor. For example, in recent debates about European identity, the neglect of the affective side of identification leads to a displacement of cathectic energy, which is now invested in anti-European political and ideological discourses. Modern society is defined by the lack of an ultimate transcendental guarantee, or, in libidinal terms, of total jouissance. There are three main ways to cope with this negativity, utopian, democratic, and post-democratic. The first, totalitarianism, fundamentalism, tries to reoccupy the ground of absolute jouissance by attaining a utopian and harmonious society, which eliminates negativity. The second, the democratic, enacts a political equivalent of traversing the fantasy. It institutionalizes the lack itself by creating the space for political antagonisms. The third, consumerist, post-democracy, tries to neutralize negativity by transforming politics into apolitical administration. Individuals pursue their consumerist fantasies in the space regulated by expert social administration. Today, when democracy is gradually evolving into consumerist post-democracy, one should insist that the democratic potential is not exhausted. Democracy as an unfinished project could have been Stavrakakis's motto here. The key to the resuscitation of this democratic potential is to remobilize enjoyment. What is needed, in other words, is an enjoyable democratic ethics of the political. It is deeply symptomatic that Stavrakakis is silent about a key shift in Leclerc's writings over the last few years. In his populist reason, Leclerc clearly changed his position from radical democracy to populism, reducing democracy to the moment of democratic demand within the system. This shift has clear political grounds and implications. Suffice it to mention Leclerc's support for Hugo Chavez. One can easily imagine a situation determined by a tension between the institutionalized democratic power bloc and the oppositional populist bloc, in which Leclerc, and let me add to avoid a misunderstanding, here I would side with him, would opt for the populist bloc. When Stavrakakis criticizes my claim that a progressive military dictatorship can play a positive role, he is obviously not aware of my implicit reference to Leclerc. But the key question here is, of course, what kind of enjoyment are we talking about? Libidinal investment and the mobilization of jouissance are the necessary prerequisite for any sustainable identification, from nationalism to consumerism. This also applies to the radical democratic ethics of the political. But the type of investment involved has still to be decided. Stavrakakis's solution is neither the phallic enjoyment of power nor the utopia of the incestuous full enjoyment, but a non-phallic, non-all, partial enjoyment. Predictably, I fit into this scheme as a representative of the incestuous utopia among the disillusioned leftists who, unable to mourn proletarian revolution and utopia, opt for a nostalgic return to the old, defeated and dangerous politics of reoccupation. Again, as if my Lenin book, Revolution at the Gate, is not precisely a book of mourning, not of melancholic attachment, but of parting with Lenin. Consequently, to repeat Lenin does not mean a return to Lenin. To repeat Lenin is to accept that Lenin is dead, that his particular solution failed, even failed monstrously, but that there was a utopian spark in it worth saving. 
To repeat Lenin means that one has to distinguish between what Lenin effectively did and the field of possibilities that he opened up, the tension in Lenin between what he effectively did and another dimension, what was in Lenin more than Lenin himself. To repeat Lenin is to repeat not what Lenin did, but what he failed to do, his missed opportunities. In the last pages of his book, trying to demonstrate how democratic subjectivity is capable of inspiring high passions, Stavrakakis refers to the other Lacanian jouissance, a jouissance beyond accumulation, domination and fantasy, an enjoyment of the not all or not whole. How do we achieve this jouissance? By way of accomplishing the sacrifice of the phantasmatic objet petit a, which can only make this other jouissance attainable. The central task in psychoanalysis and politics is to detach the objet petit a from the signifier of the lack in the other. To detach anti-democratic and post-democratic fantasy from the democratic institutionalization of lack, making possible the access to a partial enjoyment beyond fantasy. Only thus shall we be able to really enjoy our partial enjoyment, without subordinating it to the cataclysmic desire of fantasy. Beyond its dialectics of disavowal, this is the concrete challenge the Lacanian left addresses to us. The underlying idea is astonishingly simplistic. In total contradiction to Lacan, Stavrakakis reduces the objet petit a to its role in fantasy. The objet a is that excessive x which magically transforms the partial objects which occupy the place of the lack in the other into the utopian promise of the impossible fullness of jouissance. What Stavrakakis proposes is thus the vision of a society in which desire functions without an objet a, without the destabilizing excess which transforms it into a cataclysmic desire of fantasy. As Stavrakakis puts it in a symptomatically tautological way, we should learn to really enjoy our partial enjoyment. For Lacan, on the contrary, the objet a is another name for the Freudian partial object which is why it cannot be reduced to its role in fantasy, which sustains desire. It is for this reason that, as the Kant emphasizes, one should distinguish its role in desire and in the drive. Following Jacques-Alain Miller, a distinction has to be introduced here between two types of lack, the lack proper and the whole. Lack is spatial, designating a void within the space, while the whole is more radical. It designates the point at which the spatial order itself breaks down, as in the black hole in physics. Therein resides the difference between desire and drive. Desire is grounded in its constitutive lack, while drive circulates around a hole, a gap in the order of being. In other words, the circular movement of the drive obeys the weird logic of the curved space, in which the shortest distance between two points is not a straight line, but a curve. The drive knows that the shortest way to attain its aim is to circulate around its goal object. One should bear in mind here Lacan's well-known distinction between the aim and the goal of the drive. While the goal is the object around which the drive circulates, its true aim is the endless continuation of this circulation as such. Miller also proposed a Benjaminian distinction between constituted anxiety and constituent anxiety, which is crucial with regard to the shift from desire to drive. While the first designates the standard notion of the terrifying and fascinating abyss of anxiety which haunts us, its infernal circle which threatens to draw us in, the second stands for the pure confrontation with the objet petit a as constituted in its very loss. Miller is right to emphasize here two features. The difference which separates constituted from constituent anxiety concerns the status of the object with regard to fantasy. In a case of constituted anxiety, the object dwells within the confines of a fantasy, whereas we get the constituent anxiety only when the subject traverses the fantasy and confronts the void, the gap, filled up by the phantasmatic object. However, clear and convincing as it is, this formula of Miller's misses the true paradox, or rather, the ambiguity of the objet a. When he defines the objet a, as the object which overlaps with its loss, which emerges at the very moment of its loss, so that all its phantasmatic incarnations, from breasts to voice and gaze, are metonomic figurations of the void, of nothing. He remains within the horizon of desire, 
the true object cause of desire, is the void filled in by its phantasmatic incarnations. While, as Lacan emphasizes, the objet A is also the object of the drive, the relationship is here thoroughly different. Although in both cases the link between object and loss is crucial, in the case of the objet A as the object cause of desire, we have an object which is originally lost, which coincides with its own loss, which emerges as lost. While in the case of the objet A as the object of the drive, the object is directly the loss itself. In the shift from desire to drive, we pass from the lost object to loss itself as an object. That is to say, the weird movement called drive is not driven by the impossible quest for the lost object. It is a push to directly enact the loss, the gap cut distance itself. There is thus a double distinction to be drawn here, not only between the objet A and its phantasmatic and post-phantasmatic status, but also within this post-phantasmatic domain itself, between the lost object cause of desire and the object loss of drive. The startling thing is that Stavrakakis's idea of sustaining desire without the objet A contradicts not only Lacan, but also Leclerc's notion of hegemony. Leclerc is on the right track when he emphasizes the necessary role of the objet A in rendering an ideological edifice operative. In hegemony, a particular empirical object is elevated to the dignity of the thing. It starts to function as the stand-in for, the embodiment of, the impossible fullness of society. As we have noted, he refers to Joan Kopiec, comparing hegemony to the breast value attached to partial objects, which stand in for the incestuous maternal thing, breast. Leclau should, in fact, be criticized here for confounding desire, sustained by fantasy, with drive, one of whose definitions is also that which remains of desire after its subject traverses the fantasy. For him, we are condemned to searching for impossible fullness, drive, in which we directly enjoy lack itself, simply does not appear on his horizon. However, this in no way entails that, in drive, we really enjoy our partial enjoyment, without the disturbing excess. For Lacan, lack and excess are strictly correlative, the two sides of the same coin. Precisely insofar as it circulates around a whole, the drive is the name of the excess that pertains to human being. It is the too-muchness of striving which insists beyond life and death. This is why Lacan sometimes even directly identifies the drive with the objet A as surplus enjoyment. Because he ignores this excess of drive, Stavrakakis also operates with a simplified notion of traversing the fantasy, as if fantasy is a kind of illusory screen blurring our relation to partial objects. This notion fits perfectly with the common-sense idea of what psychoanalysis should do, of course it should liberate us from the whole of idiosyncratic fantasies and enable us to confront reality the way it effectively is, but this, precisely, is what Lacan does not have in mind. What he aims at is almost the exact opposite. In our daily existence, we are immersed in reality, structured supported by the fantasy. And this immersion is disturbed by symptoms which bear witness to the fact that another repressed level of our psyche resists this immersion. To traverse the fantasy, therefore, paradoxically means fully identifying oneself with the fantasy. Namely, with the fantasy which structures the excess, resisting our immersion into daily reality. Or, to quote a succinct formulation by Richard Boothby, Traversing the fantasy thus does not mean that the subject somehow abandons its involvement with fanciful caprices and accommodates itself to pragmatic reality, but precisely the opposite. The subject is submitted to that effect of the symbolic lack that reveals the limit of everyday reality. To traverse the fantasy in the Lacanian sense is to be more profoundly claimed by the fantasy than ever, in the sense of being brought into an ever more intimate relation with that real core of the fantasy that transcends imagining. Boothby is right to emphasize the Janus-like structure of a fantasy. A fantasy is simultaneously pacifying, disarming, providing an imaginary scenario which enables us to endure the abyss of the other's desire, and shattering, disturbing, inassimilable into our reality. The ideological-political dimension of this notion of traversing the fantasy was rendered clear by the unique role the rock group Top Lista Nadrialista, 
the top list of the Surrealists, played during the Bosnian War in besieged Sarajevo. Their ironic performances, which, in the midst of the war and hunger, satirized the predicament of the Sarajevo population, acquired a cult status not only in counterculture, but also among the citizens of Sarajevo in general. The group's weekly TV show went on throughout the war and was extremely popular. Instead of bemoaning the tragic fate of the Bosnians, they daringly mobilized all the cliches about the stupid Bosnians, which were a commonplace in Yugoslavia, fully identifying with them. The point thus made was that the path of true solidarity leads through direct confrontation with the obscene racist fantasies which circulated in the symbolic space of Bosnia, through playful identification with them, not through the denial of these obscenities in the name of what people are really like. No wonder, then, that when Stavrakakis tries to provide some concrete examples of this new politics of partial enjoyment, things become really bizarre. He starts with Marshall Salins' thesis that the Paleolithic communities followed a Zen road to affluence. Although deeply marked by divisions, exchange, sexual difference, violence and war, they lack the shrine of the unattainable, of infinite needs, and thus the desire for accumulation. In them, enjoyment seems to be had without the mediation of fantasies of accumulation, fullness, and excess. They do show that another world may, in principle, be possible, insofar as a detachment of partial enjoyment from dreams of completeness and phantasmatic desire is enacted. Doesn't something similar happen in the psychoanalytic clinic? And isn't this also the challenge for radical democratic ethics? Again, is the idea here not precisely that of a society without lack? The way the Paleolithic tribesmen avoided accumulation was to cancel lack itself. It is the idea of such a society without the excess of infinite needs, which is properly utopian, the ultimate fantasy, the fantasy of a society before the fall. What then follows is a series of examples of how political theorists and analysts, economists and active citizens, some of them directly inspired by Lacanian theory, are currently trying to put this radical democratic orientation to work in a multitude of empirical contexts. For example, a group of cooperative workers, Byrne and Healy, have examined and tried to restructure their enjoyment in a non-phantasmatic way. It would be certainly interesting to hear in detail how this restructuring was carried out. Then comes Robin Blackburn's proposal for the democratization of pension funds, Roberto Unger's proposal to pass from a family to a social inheritance system, Tony Negri's proposal for a minimum citizenship income, the projects of participatory budgets in Brazil. What all this has to do with jouissance féminine remains a mystery. The vague underlying idea is that in all these cases we are dealing with modest pragmatic proposals, with partial solutions which avoid the excess of radical utopian re-foundation definitely not enough to qualify them as cases of jouissance féminine, which is precisely Lacan's name, for absolute excess. Stavrakakis' attempt to relate Lacanian concepts like feminine jouissance, the signifier of the lack in the other, and so on, to concrete socio-political examples is thus thoroughly unconvincing. When he quotes Joan Kopiak's precise thesis on how Suppléance allows us to speak well of our desire, not by translating jouissance into language, but by formalizing it in a signifier that does not mean it, but is, rather, directly enjoyed. He reads it as a way to think of enjoyment and the production of a signifier of lack in a democratic perspective. But does Kopiak's description not also perfectly fit nationalism? Is the name of the nation not such as suppléance? When a passionate patriot exclaims, America! Does he thereby not produce a signifier, which does not translate jouissance into language, but formalizes it in a signifier that does not mean it, but is, rather, directly enjoyed? Stavrakakis' political vision is vacuous. It is not that his call for more passion in politics is in itself meaningless. Of course, the contemporary left needs more passion. The problem is rather that it resembles all too much the joke quoted by Lacan about a doctor asked by a friend for free medical advice. Unwilling to give his services without payment, the doctor examines the friend and then calmly states, you need medical advice. Paradoxically, for all his justified critique of Freudo Marxism, Stavrakakis's position can be designated as Freudo-radical democracy. 
He remains within Freudian Marxism, expecting psychoanalysis to supplement the theory of radical democracy in the same way Wilhelm Reich, amongst others, expected psychoanalysis to supplement Marxism. In both cases, the problem is exactly the same. We have the appropriate social theory, but what is missing is the subjective factor. How are we to mobilize people so that they will engage in passionate political struggle? Here, psychoanalysis enters, explaining what libidinal mechanisms the enemy is using. Reich tried to do this for fascism, Stavrakakis for consumerism and nationalism, and how the left can practice its own politics of jouissance. The problem is that such an approach is an ersatz political analysis. The lack of passion in political praxis and theory should be explained in its own terms. That is, in the terms of political analysis itself. The true question is, what is there to be passionate about? Which political choices fit people's experience as realistic and feasible? The moment we pose the question in this way, the contours of our ideological constellation appear in a different manner, underlining W.B. Yeats's famous lines, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. These lines seem to offer a perfect description of the current split between anemic liberals and impassioned fundamentalists. The best are no longer able fully to engage, while the worst engage in racist, religious, sexist fanaticism. Are, however, the terrorist fundamentalists, be they Christian or Muslim, really fundamentalists in the authentic sense of the term? Do they really believe? What they lack is a feature that is easy to discern in all authentic fundamentalists, from Tibetan Buddhists to the Amish in the US. The absence of resentment and envy, deep indifference towards the non-believer's way of life. If today's so-called fundamentalists really believe that they have found their way to truth, why should they feel threatened by non-believers? Why should they envy them? When a Buddhist encounters a Western hedonist, he hardly condemns the latter. He just benevolently notes that the hedonist's search for happiness is self-defeating. In contrast to true fundamentalists, terrorist pseudo-fundamentalists are deeply bothered, intrigued, fascinated by the sinful life of non-believers. One senses that, in fighting the sinful other, they are fighting their own temptation. This is why the so-called Christian or Muslim fundamentalists are a disgrace to true fundamentalism. It is here that Yeats's diagnosis falls short of the present predicament. The passionate intensity of a mob bears witness to a lack of true conviction. Deep inside themselves, terrorist fundamentalists also lack true conviction. Their violent outbursts are proof. How fragile the belief of a Muslim must be if he feels threatened by a stupid caricature in a low-circulation Danish newspaper. Fundamentalist Islamist terror is not grounded in the terrorist conviction of their superiority and in their desire to safeguard their cultural religious identity from the onslaught of global consumerist civilization. The problem with fundamentalists is not that we consider them inferior to us, but rather that they themselves secretly consider themselves inferior. This is why our condescending, politically correct assurances that we feel no superiority towards them only makes them more furious and feeds their resentment. The problem is not cultural difference, their effort to preserve their identity. But the opposite fact, that the fundamentalists are already like us, that secretly they have already internalized our standards and measured themselves by them. This clearly goes for the Dalai Lama, who justifies Tibetan Buddhism in the Western terms of the pursuit of happiness and the avoidance of pain. Paradoxically, what fundamentalists really lack is precisely a dose of that true racist conviction of one's own superiority. It would be instructive to refer here to Rousseau, who described the inversion of the libidinal investment from the object to the obstacle, which prevents our access to the object. This is why egalitarianism itself should never be accepted at face value. The notion and practice of egalitarian justice, insofar as it is sustained by envy, relies on the inversion of the standard renunciation accomplished to benefit others. I am ready to renounce it, so that others will also not be able to have it. Far from being opposed to the spirit of sacrifice, evil is thus the very spirit of sacrifice itself, ready to ignore one's own well-being, if, through my sacrifice, I can deprive the other of his jouissance. And do we not encounter the same negative passion also in politically correct multicultural liberalism? 
is its inquisitorial pursuit of the traces of racism and sexism in the details of personal behaviour not in itself indicative of the passion of resentment. Fundamentalism's passion is a false one, while anemic liberal tolerance relies on a disavowed perverse passion. The distinction between fundamentalism and liberalism is sustained by a shared underlying feature. They are both permeated by the negative passion of resentment.